Hello again, I'm glad to see you. I'm the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. We're going to look at Socratic Logic by Peter Kreeft. This time we're going to think about definitions and defining terms, and we'll work through a few exercises. Now, as you may remember, this is one of my go-to recommendations if you're interested in traditional verbal style logic. Logic is not just mathematics. A part of logic explicitly is a liberal art, so to speak. And if you want to read better, write better, Learning traditional verbal style logic is definitely the way to go. And you shouldn't only study mathematical logic. Traditional verbal style logic is really an interesting, fascinating topic, and it will help develop your critical reasoning skills. This helped me, and I'm sure it will help you as well. In any case, if we turn to page 124 of Socratic Logic by Dr. Kreeft, it talks about six rules for a logically acceptable definition. So let's go through this and work through some exercises. So one, a definition should be coextensive with the thing defined, neither too broad nor too narrow. This is the most important rule and the hardest to obey. It concerns the extension of the term rather than the comprehension. So if we're going to define our term, we don't want to include inadvertently other things, nor do we want to miss certain things. We want coextensive. Number two, a definition should be clear, not obscure. Three, a definition should be literal, not metaphorical. Four, a definition should be brief, not long. Five, a definition should be positive, not negative, if possible. Only negative realities call for negative definitions. Six, a definition should not be circular. The term defined cannot appear in the definition. When you get into section three, he talks about the kinds of definition. And in another video, I'm going to go through this. A lot of traditional logic textbooks will talk about this, nominal versus real definitions, essential versus non-essential. We can think about definitions by properties, accidents, causes, efficient cause, final cause, material cause, by effects. And then Creep goes into this in detail, and he has a really good chart on page 127. So he thinks about man, triangle, democracy, and he gives different definitions. Some definitions are not that great. For example, the definition is too broad or too narrow, or it's obscure, or it's metaphorical, too long, negative, circular, nominal, but also essential. That's a good definition. By property, by accidents, by efficient cause, final cause, material cause, and from effects. He then talks about the limits of definition. He talks about how individuals cannot strictly be defined. Um, that makes a lot of sense, right? You're not going to define Socrates. You can describe Socrates, but it's not as if there's an essential definition of Socrates or Plato. So in the exercises, um, the first part, which we're not going to do here, is just to give a good definition of the following terms. But then in part two, we're to classify and evaluate each of the following definitions. If it is too broad or too narrow, say what? Say why, excuse me. What is there in the subject that is not in the predicate if the predicate is too narrow? And what is there in the predicate that is not in the subject if the predicate is too broad? The definition is quoted from literary sources, section B, especially designed to stimulate fruitful philosophical arguments. So A, we have shorter, easier exercises. And there are many, 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 as you can see. Look at that, there's 50 of them. Then we get into quotations from Henry Adams to, for example, William James, Marx. You have stuff from the Bible, Thomas Aquinas, Plato, Spinoza, Immanuel Kant, John Dewey, and many, many more. So here you have another page of this. You have H.L. Mencken, Thomas Hobbes, and Pascal. And all the way to 41, to Emerson. And then you have some stuff inspired by G.K. Chesterton. And then we have some more critical thinking here for D, because we're going to evaluate the following. Now, we're only going to do some of this, as you shall see. So let's begin. Okay, so this, again, is based on Peter Kreef's textbook, Socratic Logic. And we can condense Dr. Kreef's three, pardon me, condense his rules into three. 
So a good definition, a logical definition, should be coextensive, clear, literal, brief, not negative or circular. So page 131, let's start on the exercises. Number one, and we're thinking about the sentence as a definition. Is it a logical definition? That's the question. So number one is, life is the most vivid of all dreams. Now, it is a proposition because it's declaring something to be the case, right? So I suppose we can analyze it as a proposition in that sense. But is it really a good definition? It doesn't seem so. At most, it's metaphorical, I suppose. It doesn't seem like a good definition. But think about the predicate. The most vivid of all dreams. What does a dream presuppose? Are we always dreaming? Well, dream, dream is not a genius for life. You have to be alive in order to dream. So it seems like this is not a very good definition at all. Let's get into number four. A bishop is a clergyman who exercises Episcopal functions. Well, that seems like it doesn't tell us much. A bishop is a clergyman who exercises functions of a bishop. That's basically what it is saying, right? So it looks circular. It's not a good definition because we have the noun bishop. We have the adjective form, Episcopal. What number five? Trade is the interchange of goods. Trade is the interchange of goods. Well, it's nice and short and clear. It's brief. It's not negative or circular. It seems coextensive, so it looks like a good definition. It seems like an essential definition. More can be said about trade. So one of the most interesting topics to study is called praxeology, um, the study of the logic of human action, purposeful human action. And we could unpack a lot in terms of what it means to trade. But it seems like a good definition. How about number eight? Life is the opposite of death. Okay. It's a good sentence, but is it a good definition? It doesn't seem so because it's negative. Okay, so we want to avoid that. I mean, it's not a bad sentence, nothing wrong with it, but we're thinking about is this a good definition? Is it a good definition? That's really what we're asking. Life is a bowl of cherries. Well, that's at most metaphorical, so it's not very good. It's not a good definition. We want something literal. And um, I'm not even sure it's a good metaphor either. So continuing on, just a few more. So page 20, or page 20, excuse me, number 20. So you can see why I'm more of a writer than I'm a speaker. But I'll try to improve. A circle is something round. Would that be a good definition? Well, it seems no, because it's circular, because something that's round and circle seem to go hand in hand. But even then, we might think it's too broad because not everything round is a circle. Um, you get something that's roundish, that's not a circle. So that's not very good. On page 133, let's go to number four from Oliver um, Branston. So it's a quote, philosophy is common sense in a dress suit. Hmm. Well, it's metaphorical, right? Um, but beyond that, it's not a good definition. It's an interesting metaphor. Um, a lot of people think philosophy should defend common sense. That is one um, point of view. Others are much more skeptical of that kind of claim. But a lot of people take the default position that, hey, it should defend common sense. How about number five? Religion is the opiate of the people. Well, once again, we have something that's metaphorical. It's not really a definition of religion, right? Um, and it's more of an evaluation. So it's not descriptive, by the way. So it's an evaluation, too. How about number 11? Faith is what you believe... Pardon me. Faith is when you believe something that you know ain't true. And this is a schoolboy in The Will to Believe by William James. Faith is when you believe something that you know ain't true. Hmm. That's interesting, because that's contradictive, right? You believe something, but you know it's not true. You believe and not believe? Hmm. So it's not a good definition. 
There's no real good genius. The is when. And like I said, it's self-contradictory, right? So that doesn't get us anywhere. But it's interesting to analyze. It is self-contradictory. Um, number 13, justice is health of soul. That's from Plato. Again, that's metaphorical only. It's an interesting metaphor. Um, you'll find it in the Republic. Um, so he compares um, the justice of the the city and the justice of the soul. There's like an analogy uh, between them in his, in his view. And number 41, the last one we'll do here. So it's a pretty straightforward. A friend is a person with whom I may be sincere. This is from Emerson. Okay, interesting, good sentence. Um, you wanna be sincere with your friend, of course, but is it a good definition? I don't think so. But also, can't you be sincere with enemies? So yeah, maybe so. It's a good um, sentence, but it's not a good definition. And again, why can't I be sincere with my enemies? So there seems to be a problem there if we're thinking about this in a logical sense. Is it a good logical definition? It doesn't really limit itself um, to the extension we want. All right, so this is, just very briefly, um, a tour of some exercises from Socratic Logic by Peter Kreeft. If you want more videos like this, let me know in the comments below. If you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comments below. I would appreciate it. Um, thank you for watching this and supporting this YouTube channel. Um, I'm very grateful that there are people out there who do enjoy this content. I hope, I hope they do. I hope you do, you do enjoy it. In any case, I'm the Amateur Logician. Um, be well and God bless you.